Yesterday we defined energy. Energy is the ability to do work. The ability to do work. Now, energy can be doing work now. If it is, what kind of energy do we have? If it's doing something now, we have, somebody said it, kinetic energy, right. If it has the ability to do work, it's not doing it right now, but it's storing it to do work later on, then we call it what kind of energy? Potential energy, right? So we got kinetic energy, which is really energy that's doing something right now. In other words, energy of motion. And then we've got potential energy, which is energy that isn't really doing anything right now, but is being stored so that it can do something later on. Now, kinetic energy, we don't really distinguish between different types of kinetic energy because in the end, anything that's moving has kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy is always described by this equation. Ek is equal to 1 half mv squared. By the way, what does m stand for there? It's mass, good. And mass is in what units? Kilograms. Is mass a vector or a scalar? Do you guys remember that? Is there a direction associated with mass? My mass is 70 kilograms. Is it 70 kilograms to the west? It's just 70 kilograms, right? So mass is a scalar. What about V? What does that stand for? Yep. V is speed. V is speed. Good. A lot of people look at that and just automatically say it's velocity. I'm not sure why. That's the first word that comes out of our mouth. It's not velocity. It's speed. Speed is a vector or a scalar. It's a scalar, yeah. And what are the units for V, for speed? Yep. Good, meters per second. Now, we have to do a conversion with the speed sometimes. We had to do this yesterday, and some of us were confused. that We forgot how to do that conversion. The most common one is kilometers per hour to meters per second. Let's say we have 90 kilometers per hour. We want to convert that to meters per second. How do we do it? Let's convert. Go ahead. Okay, so let's convert kilometers to, to, to uh, meters first. So it becomes 90,000 meters. Good. And then we've got to convert hours to seconds, and how many seconds in an hour? 3,600. So it becomes 90 times 1,000 divided by 3,600, which gives me 25, in this case, meters per second. So multiply by 1,000, divide by 3,600. Go ahead. There is a shortcut to divide by 3.6, yes. Uh, but right now, I just assume you not use that shortcut, because if you, some, a lot, what will happen to a lot of people is they'll forget whether we multiply or divide by 3.6. Plus, if you ever see a different unit conversion, not kilometers per hour to meters per second, that it doesn't help you at all. Okay, this does, because it kind of gives you the idea behind how we convert any unit to any other unit. So it is a shortcut. It works. I wouldn't mark you wrong for it, but I just assume you not use it right now. All right, that's kinetic energy. That's, that's all types of kinetic energy. Okay, that's not just the kinetic energy of a car traveling down the road, but it's also the kinetic energy of an electron as it orbits around a nucleus. Okay, it's also the kinetic energy of the Earth as it orbits around the sun. Okay, it doesn't matter what the scale, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. If an object is moving, that's how we describe its kinetic energy. Now, potential energy, we did distinguish between different types of potential energy. What was one of the types? What was the big type that we're going to use a lot this unit? The type that we used yesterday, in fact. Gravitational potential energy. What was another type of potential energy that we talked a little bit about yesterday, but we didn't use? Yep. Spring potential or elastic potential. Um, spring potential energy is the energy that's stored in a spring that's stretched or compressed. Elastic potential energy is the energy that's stored in an elastic. Now, we often just combine those two because, in the end, the equation that describes them is exactly the same. So, we'll combine them into spring or elastic potential. There were some other kinds as well that we talked about yesterday, we didn't use yesterday, and we won't use in Physics 20, but still are forms of potential energy, stored energy. What was one of them? Yep. Chemical potential energy. Chemical potential energy, really? Nuclear energy. We're going to learn about uh, nuclear energy in physics 30, and chemical energy we won't learn about at all in physics 20 or physics 30. Okay, you'll learn about that somewhat in chemistry, probably somewhat, maybe not quantitatively, but you'll learn about it in a little bit more detail in biology as well. This type and this type will do 
uh, in physics 20. In fact, today, nuclear we'll do in physics 30. Any others? Any others besides what we see up on the board here? Electrical potential energy, which we'll also learn about in physics 30. Okay, uh, the energy stored, um, the energy stored in the electrical system. Okay, this is the one we talked about yesterday: gravitational potential energy. The equation was EP is equal to one half. Sorry, wasn't. EP is equal to mgh. M stands for mass in kilograms, scalar. G is 9.81. H stands for height in meters. Height above what? The height above whatever you want. The height above the floor, okay, the potential energy relative to the floor is based on the height above the floor. The potential energy relative to the desk is, the, is based on the height above the desk. Right now, Lane's, Lane's book is on his desk. What's its potential energy relative to the floor? Something. M times G times whatever the height is above the floor. What's the potential energy of that book right now relative to his desk? Zero, because the height above the desk is zero. It has potential to fall to the floor. It has no potential to fall to his desk because it's already there on his desk. What's the potential energy of his apple relative to his hand? Zero, because it has no potential to fall to his hand, right? If we're looking at gravitational potential, it has chemical potential, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be eating it. Um, we haven't talked about the units for energy yet. Not today, at least. For either type of energy, whether we're talking about potential or kinetic, we always measure energy in joules, yeah. And uh, in energy, joules, vector, or scalar? S scalar. You can have a negative value, but it doesn't mean that it's to the left or that it's down. Okay? A negative value for energy, well... We usually more see a negative value for a change in energy as opposed to, to energy. That would mean a loss of energy. But in the end, if you had a, say, gravitational potential energy, and you had a height below where your reference point was, then you could, some, you could say that uh, the gravitational potential energy was negative as well. But it doesn't mean left or down or south or whatever. It's not a vector. Okay. All right, we had a few questions for homework. The first little bit of homework we had was on page 298, and it related to gravitational potential energy. Second bit of homework we had was on 305. Let's take a look at 298 first. Three questions. Any issues with any of those three questions that you'd like to go over here today? Yep. Number three. Just number three. Going once. Going twice. All right. Three it is. It says a winch pulls a 250-kilogram block up a 20-meter long inclined plane, tilted at an angle 35 degrees to the horizontal. What's the change in gravitational potential energy that the block undergoes? Here's the inclined plane. We're at an angle of 35.0 degrees. Uh, we have a 250-kilogram block, and this winch is pulling it up this 20-meter long inclined plane. We want to find the change in potential energy. Now, this 20 meters, uh, I was going to say it's not even relevant. It is, but not directly relevant. We're simply going to use the 20 meters to find something else. Not to find the potential energy directly, but to find something else. What are we going to use that 20 meters in that angle at 35 degrees to find? Josh? The height. Yeah, let's get the height here. The height is the opposite side of that triangle. The 20 meters is the hypotenuse. So let's use sine 35 degrees is equal to opposite over the hypotenuse. We're going to say h is equal to 20 times sine 35. What do we get for that? 11.47 meters. Thank you, Hayden. What do we do with that now? Jace, what are we going to do with that now? Now that we got the height, want to find the change in potential energy, what are we going to do? Yeah? Uh, be careful. Change it by mass and gravity. Um, mass times gravity actually is the weight, right? So you're not, to, you're not multiplying it by weight and gravity. You're either multiplying it by mass and gravity, or you're just multiplying it by weight. 
which is already m times g. I know what you meant. You just didn't quite say it right. That's all. Um, when we do that, that's going to give us the final potential energy, right? MGH. It's going to be 250 kilograms times 9.81 times the final height, which is 11.47 meters. When we do that math, we end up getting we end up getting 2.81 times 10 to the 4. Is that my answer? Kind of. Kind of. Now, I haven't actually solved for the change in potential energy yet, have I? That's the answer that's written down on the... It's the answer that's written down in my uh, answers at the end of the questions. What have I solved for? Not the change, but rather the the final potential energy, right? So why is it the same as the change if it's if we haven't solved for the change? If we just solved for the final. Why is it the same value that they give us for the change? Yes, the initial height is a zero, further for the initial potential is zero. So if you say the final minus the initial and the initial is zero, then the change is just simply going to be the final, right? So that's our answer, 2.81 times 10 to the 4 joules. How many people got that? OK, good. OK, let's take a look now at the other little bit of homework you had, which is on page 305. For that one, we had question number 7 and 9. Either of those that we want to go over, 7, 9, right? 9. Are we okay with seven, or do we want seven going over as well? Yep. Number seven says you're working on the fifth floor of a building at a height of 18 meters above the sidewalk. Construction crane lifts a mass of 350 from the street level to the 12th floor of the building, 22 meters above you. Relative to your position, what's the gravitational potential energy of the mass at street level when it's on the 12th floor, and what's the change in gravitational potential as it's raised? This is a... I, I, I read this and, and see it as a little confusing, actually. The, all the numbers that we have here, the fifth floor, the twelfth floor, 18 meters above, 22 meters above. Uh, you know what? I think the best thing to do here is draw a little picture. Okay, we don't have to, but I think it's helpful to do that. Here's the street level. Here's the ground. Okay, here's the fifth floor. Here's the twelfth floor. The fifth floor is 18 meters above the ground. The 12th floor, you're working right here, right? On the 5th floor. The 12th floor is 22 meters above you. And we've got a mass of this object that's going to the 12th floor, has a mass of 350 kilograms. It's going up to the 12th floor. We want to know the potential energy of the mass at street level. Oh, there's an easy one. Oh, wait, no, it's not, because it's relative to your position. I was just going to say it was zero, right? If it was zero, if I wrote down zero at least, I would have misread the question. It's not zero, but why did I think it was zero? Because it's on the ground. What's the potential energy of that object relative to the ground? Zero. But that's not what the question asks. It asks it relative to me. So we're going to say it's m times g times h, which is 350 times 9.81. We always make it positive 9.81 in these energy questions. Times the height of not negative 12. It's going to be negative 18 meters. What do we get for that? Negative 61 meter 3 joules. Or we're going to say negative uh, 6.18 times 10 to the 4 joules. So what does this hold the idea about a negative potential energy? It just means that, go ahead. Yeah, in order to get to that height, in order to get to where I'm standing on the fifth floor of that building, it needs to gain 6.18 times 10 to the 4 joules. This is not a vector, right? We're not talking about 6.18 down. It's just that it needs to gain that much to get to the fifth floor. OK, when it's on the 12th floor, go ahead. Um, 
Keep going. <laughs> are you talking about like? Are you thinking about other kinds of potential energy? Um, yeah, it's essentially only with gravitational potential energy because it would be difficult to quantify. Uh, I, I can't think of a way necessarily of quantifying chemical potential energy that way, for instance, or nuclear potential energy uh, as a negative value. And to be honest, normally we don't even quantify gravitational potential energy that way. But it can be, okay, technically, because it's relative to something above you. You can always, with all kinds of energy, there's often a negative change in energy. You probably learned that in chemistry, that you can have a negative change, which means a loss of energy, right? But not usually in a, a negative absolute energy like you have right here. Question B. Question B says when it's on the 12th floor, relative to you, on the 12th floor, what's its potential energy? Again, we're going to say EP is equal to MGH. We're going to say, once again, 350 times 9.81 times, what are we going to use for the height this time? Yep, Bailey? Uh, 22 and 18? No. It's not 22 and 18. Just 22. It's just, it's just 22, right? It's just 22, Bailey, because we're trying to find the potential energy relative to my position, which is on this floor, right? Relative to the ground, it would be 22 plus 18. So that's not wrong. It's not wrong to say the potential energy is m times g times 40. But it's not wrong if you're looking for the energy relative to the ground, the ability to fall to the ground, not to the fifth floor. What do we get for that one? Multiply those three together. 75537, five, which is 7.55 times 10 to the 4 joules. Notice it's a positive value this time because we're above my reference point. C, what's the change in gravitational potential energy as it's raised? This doesn't sound hard. The change in potential energy as it's raised. Now let's say delta E is equal to EF minus EI. EF is 7, 5, 5, 3, 7. Subtract 6, 1, 8, 0, 3. Is that right? Negative. We can't forget that negative in there, right? Just because we're subtracting doesn't make it automatically negative. Yeah, you've got to subtract the initial amount. If the initial amount is negative, then it's subtract a negative, which makes it positive. What do we get for that? What is it? Say again? 137? 430? 340? Three, 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 which is 1.37 times 10 to the 5 joules. How many people got that? All right, the other question we had was number nine. This one says two cars A and B each have a mass of 1,200 kilograms. Uh, car A is 12 meters per second. 180 degrees is this way. Okay? Um, car B is 24 meters per second, also this way. They both increase their velocity by 10 meters per second. What's their gain in kinetic energy? And if both cars gain the same amount of velocity, why do, they, why do they gain different amounts of kinetic energy? That's a good question. All right, let's define this way as positive, since it's all going this way. Left, let's make positive to avoid negative signs in here. Let's find the change in kinetic energy of car A. It's going to be 1 half mvf squared minus one-half mvi squared. Um, Vf is, for car A, is 22 meters per second because it's 
was going 10, it increased its velocity by 10. Was going 12, it increased it by 10. Uh, no, wait a second here. Yeah, that's right. Minus 1 half of 1,200 times 12 squared. So we're doing car A here, the 1,200 kilogram car. The final speed squared minus half times the mass times the initial speed squared. What do we get when we do that math? Let's do the second car. Same thing here, right? This time it has a mass of 1,200 again. Uh, the final speed it was going 24, now it's going 34. Figure that one out too. We get 607,200, which is 6.07 times 10 to the 5 joules. Okay, let's answer question B. If both cars gain the same amount of velocity, why do they different why do they gain different amounts of kinetic energy? There's the good question here. There's the challenge question in this. Can anybody answer that one for me? Take a look at the equations. Why do they gain different amounts of kinetic energy, even though they gain the same amount of speed? Laura, why do we have different amounts of kinetic energy gained, in it, even though it's the same speed gained? Yes, because they start at different speeds. Yes, that's part of it. And, yeah? Yeah, because the number is squared. The speed is squared. Um, so, even though they gain 10 meters per second, 22 squared and 12 squared is different than uh, 34 squared and that should have been 24, shouldn't it? Not 12. So that number that number's wrong, but it's still going to be different than that number, right? 22 squared minus 12 squared is different than 34 squared minus 24 squared because they're squared. Okay? Is that good? So I just told you the little story about how we used to make the little, the little clothespin guns when we were kids. We stretched that elastic with a little, the, the little inside of the clothespin and then fired off those things. The clothespin, the inside of the clothespin moved and it hurt when you get hit by those. It hurt when you get hit by those because it had kinetic energy. We just established why it had kinetic energy, where it got it from. It got it from the stretched elastic. When we stretched that elastic, there must have been stored energy. You don't get kinetic energy from nowhere. When I'm walking across the front of the room right now, or you're driving your car down the highway, or anything is moving anywhere, it's got kinetic energy. But the kinetic energy always came from somewhere. In the case of me, it came from the chemical potential inside my body. In the case of your car, it came from the chemical potential in the gasoline. In the case of your little toy car, it came from the electrical potential energy in your battery. In the case of that elastic, stretching that elastic and letting it go and firing off that little clothespin bullet, it came from the elastic potential energy that was stored in that stretched elastic. Spring inelastic potential energy is the energy that's stored in a stretched or compressed, stretched or squished, spring or elastic, or we say something similar. Could be a piece of rubber. Okay? Um, on November 26, Tuesday, November 26, we're taking our field trip to West Edmonton Mall to study the physics of amusement park rides. One of the rides, one, one of the rides we're going to go on are the bumper cars. The bumper cars have rubber bumpers to them. The idea there is that when you hit them, you bounce apart, right? You bounce away. When you hit another car, you squish the rubber on your bumper car and the other car's bumper. Okay, that becomes elastic potential energy. Why do you bounce off? Because that elastic potential energy that was stored as, it was, as the uh, bumper was squished becomes kinetic energy as it goes back to normal. 
elastic potential energy again stored in something similar to an elastic or spring becomes kinetic energy as it gets released. Now, this stands to reason, right? The more you stretch it, the more potential energy it's going to store. Hey, if I want to fire off an elastic at you, I stretch it just a little bit, it'll move when I let it go. But if I want to fire it faster, then I'm going to stretch it even more. Hey, that was the idea when I told you that story a minute ago. I'm making these clothespin guns when we were kids. The idea, that was the idea behind trying to maximize the distance that we stretched it. Remember we said, if we stretch it too far, then the clothespin that was mounted to the hockey stick wouldn't hold it anymore. We wanted to stretch it as far as we possibly could, though, because then that maximized, although we didn't really know what we were doing at the time, it maximized the elastic potential energy stored in that elastic, and therefore it maximized the kinetic energy when it was released. Now, there is an equation to describe this, just like there's an equation to describe any kind of energy. We're going to say again, EP, potential energy, is equal to 1 half times K times X squared. Now, here's some new terms that you're not familiar with, K and X. EP is easy. That's the one that stands for elastic potential energy. It's a scalar measured in joules. X, eh. X stands for displacement. And it's measured in meters. But it's not the displacement that you're thinking of. When I throw this elastic across the room, or I throw it to Lane, just like that, the displacement of that elastic is how far it's traveled, right? It's change in position. Agree? That's not the displacement that we're talking about here. Okay, that's delta D displacement. Okay, when I throw it, or I let it go, the displacement that it travels across the room is delta D. It's not X. The X displacement is how much it's stretched, or how much it's compressed. So right now, it's just normal. But if I put it on the end of my finger and I stretch it, if I can hold it, that is. Put it on my thumb, it's easier to hold it that way. Theoretically. I've stretched it about four centimeters, which means the displacement, even though it's not moving anywhere, its displacement is four centimeters, the amount that it's stretched. Make sense? Two different kinds of displacement. Delta D that we've dealt with this up until this point, and X, which is the amount that it's stretched or compressed. Now, that other term, K, that's brand new for us. That's what we call the spring constant. The units for that are going to be newtons per meter. The spring constant is basically a measure of how stiff the spring or elastic is. This is, if you take this elastic, stretch it, right? It's a pretty stiff elastic, right? Relatively stiff elastic. That would have a high spring constant or a high elastic constant. Okay. If you take uh, some other elastic that you just you know, find you know, that maybe wraps up your newspaper or your flyers that you get on Friday or whatever, okay, that's not as stiff. That has a smaller spring constant or a smaller elastic constant. If you take the spring out of the back of a car, okay, about this high, about this far around, Okay? They're incredibly stiff. They have to hold up a car, right? They're very, very stiff. They have a very high spring constant. If you take the spring out of a pen, you can squish them easily, right? Or stretch them easily. That's a very low spring constant. Okay? So the stiffer it is, the higher the spring constant. The stiffer it is, the more potential it has to store energy, though. You have more potential energy in a car than you have in a pen when you flick the pen. So we're going to put in quotation marks here that it's the stiffness of the spring. That's not a very scientific definition, but it's really what it is, the stiffness of the spring. Now, sometimes we're not going to be given the value of this spring constant, but we're going to need it. 
So sometimes we're going to have to use this thing that we call Hooke's Law to find it. Hooke's Law on the surface isn't tricky. It's not weird. It's not strange. But if you think about it, it is a little bit more strange than things that we've done to this point. Up until now, we've dealt with a lot of different forces, but they've remained constant through an entire problem. A okay, force of friction, uh, applied force, force of air resistance, whatever. Okay, all kinds of different forces, but they're not changing throughout the problem. Hooke's law says the restoring force on this elastic, or the force that pulls it back to where I start it from. Right? As I pull it, there's a force that pulls it back to where it started from. That restoring force is not constant. That restoring force is related to the displacement. In other words, you felt this before, right? You pull an elastic one centimeter, it pulls back with a certain force. You pull an elastic five centimeters, it pulls back a lot harder, right? The force that it pulls back is dependent upon how far it's stretched, the displacement. Now, we'll often use this equation, Hooke's Law, to solve for K will often be given the value of the force, will be given the value of how far it's stretched or compressed, and we'll have to find the spring constant, and then turn around and plug that spring constant back into here. Second. Uh, good question. The question for those of you who didn't hear was, it would be changing, right? So depending upon where the object is, how far it's stretched, okay, we've got that, that little clothespin, the, the inside of the clothespin attached to the end of the elastic, let's say. Okay, its potential energy would be different depending upon where it is. Yes, absolutely. Okay, if I stretch it two centimeters, its potential energy is a certain value. If I stretch it four centimeters, its potential energy is a, is a different value, right? right? Now, the spring constant, however, be careful on that one. The spring constant is not different depending upon where it is. Okay, if, if the displacement is one meter and the force is four newtons, then the spring constant is four. If the displacement is two meters, then the force would be eight meters and the spring constant would still be four. Okay, does that make sense? So the spring constant doesn't change for a particular spring or elastic but the force and the potential energy do. Yep? Uh, that's a good question. Where is x measured from? Um, it doesn't really matter as long as you measure it um, relative to the same spot. Usually, if I just take this elastic right here, it's not stretched, it's not compressed. Usually, I'm going to say, OK, this is my zero point right here. Stretch it. OK, where is this point at the end of the elastic now? relative to the zero point that I just defined. Yeah, but I can define it over here in the middle, as long as it's, I take that middle point relative to where the middle point was. So you can define it relative to wherever you want, as long as when you stretch it, you measure that point relative to where you defined a zero point. Okay. So right here? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So now its displacement would be zero. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if I if I had an object on the end of that, okay, right now it's not stretched or compressed, its displacement would be zero. Okay, if I pull it so that you know, let's do it up here on the board here. Okay, here's my elastic. Okay, and it's you gotta somebody's holding on to it right here, okay, so that end can't move, right? Okay, this is going to be my zero point. There's going to be a little object, a little close pin insert on the end of that. Okay, its displacement right now is zero. It's not stretched or it's not compressed. Now I pull it, stretch it out so that now the close pin insert is out here. My displacement right now, I'm going to measure relative to where I started right here. So we're going to call this displacement, say this is 2 centimeters. We would call the displacement 2 centimeters in that case. Does that make sense? Okay. Now again, it doesn't really matter if you measure it from here or from 
here, right, the other side of the thing, as long as you're consistent. Okay? If I'm measuring the displacement from this spot on the spring, I have to measure it to that spot on the spring. If you're measuring it from this spot on the spring, then I'm going to measure it to that spot. If I'm measuring it from here, I'm going to measure it to here. And the displacement in all of those cases would be the same value, right? As long as you're consistent about your, your frame of reference there. Okay? Yep? Oh, boy, wouldn't that be good? An elastic attached to a spring. An elastic with a spring constant of 10 attached to a spring with a spring constant of 25. No. No, you won't. That would be... Uh, That'd be much too difficult. Yeah, I remember doing something like that, and I think it was my second year university. So you're not you're not quite there yet. Do these two equations make sense? We all have this grasp as to how elastics work, right? And the idea that the further you pull it, the more force it requires and the more energy that's stored. Because even when you're little kids, okay, when I was five years old and making those little clothespin hockey stick guns. I knew at some level, even though I had never heard of elastic potential energy, I knew at some level that I needed to pull that elastic back further if I wanted the bullet to go faster. Right? We all know that. It's just today we're learning how to describe it numerically. Okay, we know this stuff already. We're just describing it with numbers now and with equations now. Okay, so the only thing really that you need to make sure you understand beyond what you already did understand is these two equations. Okay, let's take a look at an example. 11, uh, 6.4 on 301. So it says a string is stretched, stretched uh, to a position 35 centimeters from its equilibrium position. Equilibrium position is its normal position, its unstretched position. So right away, we know its displacement is going to be what? We're not talking about how far it's moved across the room, but rather how much it's stretched. What's it stretched? 35 centimeters, right? 0 0.35 meters. It says at that point, the force required to stretch it is 10.5 newtons. Notice it says at that point. Somebody asked the question, I think it was Travis, about it changing, right, depending upon how much is stretched. Yeah, the force changes. And that's why, Travis, at this, it says, at that point, the force is 10.5 newtons. At another point, the force would be different, right? At that one particular point, 35 centimeters, the force is 10.5. What's the elastic potential energy stored in the spring? And let's worry about B later on, because we've got another number there, OK? Let's worry about B later on. Okay, we want to find potential energy by saying 1 half kx squared. But we don't know what k is, so how do we find it? You guys got this, come on. Yeah? I'm sorry? Yes, using Oak's law. k is equal to f over x. At that point, the force is 10.5 newtons. At that point, the displacement is 0.35 meters. We get a spring constant of 30 newtons per meter. So let's take that number and plug it in here. One half of 30 newtons per meter times the displacement of 0 0.35. Don't forget to square that. And when we do that, we get 1.84. Let's put the unrounded number just in case. 1.8375 joules, or should round it to 1.84 joules. Notice in this one, Frazier, to go back to your question a minute ago, it doesn't actually say, like, you know, from if there's an object attached to the spring, whether you're measure, measuring that from the front of the spring or the back of the spring, or it doesn't matter, right? As long as you're measuring it from the front of the, from the, front of the uh, object in both cases or from the back of the object in both cases or whatever, bottom line is the elastic has stretched 35 centimeters, however you look at it. B says that the stretch in the spring was allowed to reduce to 20 centimeters. What's the change in elastic potential energy? Well, let's get the new potential energy.
This is what it was. The new potential energy would be 1 half kx squared. Do we know what k is in this case? Sure we do. Have we switched the spring? Or have we switched the elastic? Let's say the, the spring constant of this elastic right now that I'm holding in my hand is 5. I'm stretching it a little bit. What's the spring constant now when I stretch it a lot? 5. The spring constant doesn't change. It's different than it is for this one. But for this elastic, it stays 5. For this elastic, it stays 30. So we got the spring constant using data from when it was stretched 0.35 meters. But we can use that for the spring constant no matter how much it's stretched. The potential was 1.84 when we had it stretched 0.35 meters. When we had it stretched 0.2 meters, my potential energy is 0.6. The change in potential energy would be 1.24 joules. Let's so real quickly go back to that clothespin pin slash hockey stick gun that me and my friends used to build when we were kids. Okay. We knew nothing about elastic potential energy per se. Never heard of it per se. But we knew exactly what you guys knew when you were little kids about elastics. We knew that it was important, if we wanted to get these things going fast, to stretch it further. We knew that the more we stretched it, the better this thing would go. Why? Because x is squared. When you double the distance, the amount that you stretch it, then you're going to quadruple the amount of potential energy, and therefore the amount of kinetic energy that gets liberated from that. So by stretching it further, you make it go faster, which is the goal, right? Are these five practice questions? Five? Let's see what we can do with those five, okay? <laughs>